Welcome back. This is Mike from Digital Offensive, and you're watching my Path to OCP. Today, we're going to take a look at Hawk. Hawk is another box from Hack the Box that's about to be retired as well. Uh, Hawk was pretty interesting. There was many different uh, steps you go through, and a couple little gotchas along the way, if you weren't enumerating properly, that might have held you up for a little bit and uh, caused you to doubt your methodologies. So, let's go through this box and see where you might have got stuck and how you would go about. Um, Rooting this box. So first off, we can see that I have my notes up here like I usually do. And we kicked off our initial MMAP scan. I like to use the name of the boxes, uh, as you've seen in other videos. If you want to add the name of your box and you don't know how, use your favorite editor, VI, Nano, whatever you use, and edit your Etsy slash host directory. And then basically add the IP address, space the name you want to use. I usually use the name.htb for hack the box. Um, I see hack the box uses a lot in a lot of their DNS enumeration stuff. So I try to stay with the same type of naming convention um, as I go through my processes. We get a couple of interesting ports to come back up. We get 21, 22, 80, and 8082. Down here you see, see I kicked off my FTP enumeration script. And basically all that is is a shell script that I'm using MMAP with. That's using uh, all the FTP scripts and uh, map scripts for FTP to do a further enumeration of that service. And you can see that we come back with NAS FTP login. And we jump over and look at port 80. We can see that as a default Drupal install. A couple of interesting things here is we have an odd IP address up here. 192.168.56.103. This is not a normal IP address that we see within the Hack the Box lab. Um, it also looks like it's kind of like a default install here. We also see that we have port 8082 open. And if we go to 8082 in our browser, we get H2 console. It says, sorry, remote connections, uh, web allow others are disabled on the server. So there's some type of configuration within this web application that's not allowing us to access it uh, remotely from outside the box. So there's probably a good chance that we're going to be doing some type of SSH tunneling, proxy chains, whatever your cup of tea is to be able to Go through the uh, go through Hawk to that other service, but let's see. <clears throat> so first thing we're going to do, let's jump into the FTP portion. So we're going to FTP to Hawk. All right, we're going to type anonymous, and helps if you can type anonymous correctly. All right, so we're logged in as an anonymous user. If we do our LS, we see there's a folder called Messages. And we can do ls here. And you see there's nothing in this directory. Or it looks like there's nothing in this directory. And this is the first gotcha. One of the things I sort of posted a lot on the forums uh, after I went through this box is a lot of people say, hey, I don't see anything in the FTP directory. Well, there is stuff in the FTP directory. You just have to know how to ask for it. So on Linux systems, if they put a dot in front of a file name, it kind of hides it uh, from plain sight. Uh, so a simple ls command won't work. I always like using ls-lai. It gives me a lot additional, a lot more additional output. I can see um, the file types. I can see uh, dates, times, and I can also see the hidden files. It gives you a little bit more output uh, to your listing command. So here we can see we have a file called .drupal.txt.enc. So if we do .get .drupal.txt.enc, we can download that file. So if we exit out of there, and we have that file. If we want to know what that file is or get us some idea of what type of file type this is, we can do a dot, uh, file dot Drupal text. And it comes back as Drupal.txt ENC OpenSSL encoded data with salted password, base64 encoded. So it looks like somehow this file has been uh, encoded. Um, something to deal with OpenSSL that we possibly can use OpenSSL to decrypt this file. Googling for this phrase, I came across a tool called Brute Force Open SSL Salt. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get the tool to work. Um, I, I had to be typing something in there wrong. Um, I, I was at a loss. I, I tried for a bit, and it got frustrating, so I looked for other methods to get around it. There's always more, more than one way into a box 9 out of 10 times. So, knowing that I couldn't get the Brute Force Open SSL Salt to work, I did some Googling. Try to find a way around my issues. I came across a script by a person named Eric. And um, so knowing that I need to find a way to decrypt this uh, encoded file, I started searching around for another way to do it since I couldn't get the brute force open SSL to work. And I came across a script by Eric Wright. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. 
Uh, I was Googling around, Googling around for open cell, ENC, decrypt, uh, salted, a, a whole bunch of different combination of words. I finally stumbled upon this script. The modification to script, not much. Most of the stuff was already laid out. Uh, the one area that I did modify that you can see here right now is I did finally de uh, determine to use AES. Uh, I figure it was a uh, ENC file, AES encryption. So I did put that in there. Um, for it to work. Originally, um, the code had a way to um, uh, cycle through all the different cipher suites and try each one against the password list until you came across the correct answer. So when you run this code here, basically uh, it will start outputting a file that looks like this. So, <clears throat> let me scroll up here a little bit. So you're gonna see it's gonna say possible match above, possible match above. And most of the stuff doesn't make sense. You're going through this, nothing is nothing. Then you come across an area like this. The following password for the portal. It says, Daniel, the following password for the portal, pencil keyboard scanner 1G3. Please let us know when the portal is ready. Kind regards, IT department. And then it keeps going through. So at this point in time, I was able to decode the message and I was able to read it and grab the password pencil keyboard scanner 123. So now that I have the password pencil keyboard scanner one two three, I know it's to the portal, and uh, Drupal being a portal, I decided to try logging here. Now it says Daniel, but if we try Daniel, Daniel doesn't work. See? Now knowing that it's Drupal, we know there's default user admin. So let's try it with admin. Trying with admin, we're able to log into the site. So now we're into the site. The next step of the uh, process here is how do we get a shell on the box? Now we have access to Drupal. Um, what else can we do? Like most content management systems, there's always a way, um, there's always ways to add modules, different options, different feature sets. And these feature sets and modules can introduce vulnerabilities into the system. One of the uh, feature sets I like in Drupal, but it is also very dangerous in Drupal, is the, the ability to uh, embed your own PHP code. Um, there's been times in the past where I was like, hey man, I would really love to have this functionality within Drupal, but I can't find a module for that, and I'm not sitting there developing a module, but I can quickly do it in PHP. So, first thing we want to do here is we want to go over modules, and we're going to search for PHP. There's a PHP filter. It allows embedded PHP code snippets to be evaluated. So you can embed PHP into your content, and that content will then be uh, rendered as PHP code. So we're going to turn this functionality on. Now, once again, if you're a true admin of Drupal, you may not want to be doing this because this is going to introduce a vulnerability into our system where a possible attacker who gets admin access to your machine can now embed PHP script, so PHP backdoors and things like that. And that's exactly what we're going to do with this. So we're going to save this configuration. Now this configuration is saved. I like to use uh, Pentest Monkey's reverse PHP uh, script whenever I can. It uh, has a lot of functionality. It works pretty uh, well and it's very smooth. So first, okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a listener. So I'm going to first go to my cd slash var slash www slash HTML directory. Um, I keep most of my scripts out there, as I said in other videos. Have it in my web root. I can download it quickly to the boxes. I know that I have one out there already called s.php from all the challenges. I'm just going to check this, make sure my IP is still the same in this one. Uh, one of the benefits of VIP, your IPs don't change often. Um, so 14.2, that is my correct IP. So I'm going to copy this. So that's the whole shell right there. We're going to copy that shell. And you saw it in the shell that I have it listening, uh, coming back to me on 443. Um, I say numerous times, use common ports that firewalls are going to allow out by default. If they're not doing um, application inspection, 9 out of 10 times, your traffic's going to be able to um, get out through the firewall and you're going to be able to get your shells, get the data, uh, data exfiltration, everything like that. So we're going to set up a netcat listening netcat-lvp443, right? So now that's listening. We're going to jump back over to our Drupal application and we're going to go over to content. Now, you can either add articles or you can add pages, whatever type of content you want to add. So we're going to add content on the top here and we're just going to create a basic page. 
Um, the difference between pages and uh, articles, pages will kind of run across the top of your page, like you can have your about section, your blog section, your store. Those are your basic your pages. The content, like the blog posts are more, um, the, the show up on the like, left or right side, depending on your, your formatting, but they're small stories that get stored onto the database and uh, they're pulled from there. So we're gonna call this back door. All right, so we called the back door. Now we're gonna paste our code in here. And I don't think this matters down here. We're just gonna call it PHP code. Come down here, hit save. As soon as we save this, you see how the page is not advancing at all? It's just sitting here spinning. That's because as soon as we did this, the page renders this as PHP code. And if we minimize this, we can come over here and we can see that our shell is connected. So at this point, if we type in host name, you can see that we're on Hawk. And our ID, we're WW data, as you can see up here as well. All right, so we're the WW data user. At this point, some of the things we can do, right? We can normally download our Linden Noom scripts or our Lin Pro check scripts and all those other tools that can automate some enumeration process. Or we can start with some basic enumeration as well. So let's check out a couple of things right off the bat. Let's do a cat slash Etsy password. Okay, in here we see a couple of interesting things. Tomcat using MySQL. Daniel, Daniel looks like he has slash home slash Daniel. Looks like it's a Python 3 as his shell. Um, that's the only user I'm seeing on this box. So most likely that's where the user flag is going to be stored. So let's just jump over the home directory and see if that home directory has weak permissions. So we're going to CD to Daniel. And right off the bat, we're able to get into Daniel. Uh, there's a user.txt file. Permissions of the user.txt file is world readable. Anyone can read this file. So we're going to cat user.txt, and now we have the user file, the uh, user flag. At this point, where do we want to go from here? Um, we know there's a, a MySQL database running because of the Drupal site. Um, somehow we have to get, become Daniel. I would say the easiest way for us to start our next step of enumeration is let's check the database, right? We know the database is running. Uh, we know most likely we find credentials for it because somewhere within Drupal is going to be stored. Normally in Drupal installs, it's installed in the site's uh, default uh, config. So if we go back over to our cd slash var slash www slash html and do an ls here, we can see that inside there is the site. So if we see these sites, do an ls, we can see there's a default, right? So if we do, we do a um, cd default ls. And inside here, you'll have settings at PHP. Now we can do cat settings that PHP and we'll grep for a password. And when we grep for the password, we get Drupal for Hawk as a password. So let's also, let's do that again for the username. And when we do that, we get Drupal as the username. So the username of the, uh, for MySQL is Drupal and the password is Drupal for Hawk. Right. So what we're gonna do here now is we know there, there's a database called Drupal because we found in the configuration file, we have the username and password. We wanna enumerate that database, see if there's any additional uh, user accounts in there. So what we can do here is we're gonna send one line commands over to Drupal. We're gonna use MySQL dash U, so the, the specifying the user Drupal, prompt for password, execute the command use Drupal. So we're using the Drupal database and show the tables within the database. So here we're gonna enter our command Drupal for Hawk. We're gonna get a list of all the tables here. The one we're interested in is users. So what we're gonna do here is, we're gonna type our, uh, our syntax. So we're gonna do select star uh, from users and that should work. Let's try that. So store from users. All right. So we should be able to list everything that's in users. Drupal for Hawk. All right. So in here we have an admin with the password. So there's only one account and we already know that password because that's how we logged in. That was the, the pencil password. 
So we know that's not going to work, and there's only one user here. Now, if you continue enumeration inside MySQL, you're going to realize there's only a couple of default uh, databases, and none of them have what you're looking for. I just wanted to show you the step, even though this is not the path through, to show you how you can use other tools for enumeration and be able to dig in via command line. Um, and just your whole thought process as you're going through this to build your methodology for other boxes. So knowing that doesn't work, what we can do is we do have that Jubal for Hawk password. We know it's, uh, we know the user Daniel. Why don't we just try using that username and password combo? Because we know there's SSH, right? So let's do SSH uh, Daniel at hawk.http. Yes. And then we're going to uh, type in Drupal for Hawk. And lo and behold, it works. So remember what we saw earlier, right? We saw that hit a Python 3 shell. So how are we going to do anything here, right? Because we're kind of stuck in a Python interpreter right now. The easiest way to continue on to this is to use a Python um, uh, to, to launch a shell with Python. Okay, so the easiest way to do this is we're going to launch a terminal. So we're going to use Python to beat Python. So we're going to import PTY, and then we're going to spawn bin slash bash. And lo and behold, we're now Daniel where standard shell. So what can we do as Daniel with a normal shell? We can check for sudo. Sorry, user down me not running sudo. So you can't run sudo, but we have a standard shell. What is the next step here? <clears throat> so we have a full shell on Daniel now. How do we go from Daniel to root? That is the question. So, so far we enumerated port 21. We enumerated port 22. Well, we're using 22 for SSH. We enumerated port 80, and that's how we got our initial web shell. We kind of checked out port 8082, but we really couldn't do much with it because it's blocking external connections. So one of the things we could look at doing with Daniel is we can set up a reverse tunnel where basically we can go from our local loopback address to a local port and have that traffic go back through this SSH session we currently have with Daniel to access port 8082 on a local machine. And to do that, we're going to use SSH. So we come over my notes. I'm going to grab the syntax directly from here. And I'm going to explain to you exactly what we're doing. <clears throat> so we're going to paste this in. Using SSH-R to create basically that reverse tunnel, we're going to create a, um, a bind on our local machine, on our Calibax, on local host to port 9082. And that's going to send us over to port 8082 over on Hawk. We're going to connect to our, our, our box at our IP address, and that's where that bind is going to happen. So we're going to hit enter here. Okay. Now that we entered our password, we're logged in here. If we do a net stat dash an pipe uh, grep listen, and we scroll up here, you can now see that connection 127.0.0.1 to port 9082. So now we have a tunnel where we can access our local loopback address and be sent across. That's the H session we have with Hawk to connect to um, the H2 console. So if we come over here and we hit enter, you can see that we're connected. We're on 127.0.0.1.9082. And we have somewhat of a GUI here. Now the thing is, we don't have the SA password. So what do we need to do? Um, the attack vectors that uh, are available out there require us to have full access to be able to do this. Um, one of the sites you can get some more information about how to attack the H2 data, uh, H2 console here is if you come over to uh, Gambler, um, it's a, a GitHub site, uh, the user is Gambler, and you can see abusing H2, H2 database aliases. So it gives you some information how to read files, output files, create shells, um, and more information. And all the way at the bottom here, it has some syntax to actually create a shell um, to get a full shell access to the box, which we'll go through uh, in a little bit once we get to that section. <clears throat> First thing we need to do though, is we need to be able to get to the console itself. And to get to the console itself, we need to somehow circumvent the SA uh, password requirement. Now, one of the things I noticed about this tool is if we click on tools, we could do a backup, we could do a restore, we could do a recover, we could delete database files, 
change file encryption. Now, if we go to backup, we can create a backup of the database. Now, to backup the database, um, we can de define where we want to back the database up to. Now, the interesting thing here is, if we go back over to tools, um, we can back up the database, we create a path to where we want to back it up to, slash temp, slash backup.zip, right? And source database name, and when I hit run, and you can see basically create a root slash test, trace.db and test.mvdb, and it puts it in that file. Now, the interesting thing is we could download that file now using Netcat or something, we can analyze that. So when we analyze that, we'll notice in there the SQL syntax. And one of the things in the SQL syntax you see is it says, if SA does not exist, create SA. So I sat there racking my brain for a little bit. I'm like, well, SA exists. Only way SA doesn't exist is if we delete the database and then it recreates the database. Now, in a production environment, I wouldn't even think about doing something like this because we delete the database and then we recreate the database. We're basically jeopardizing, uh, destroying a production system. Since this is half the box, we can do something like that. So what we'll try here is we'll come over to uh, database and we're gonna type in the name test. We're gonna run. And it said processed. So it looks like we deleted it. So now if we hit back, and let's see here, we'll go back to the main page, connect, and you can see basically we wiped out the need for the SA password to access the console. So now we're, we're in here with full root access, uh, well, full SA access to the database. Okay, so now that we're in here, now we can actually use these attacks that we found. So um, the one I like to do, I was able to simply just read the root file, and to simply read the root file, I use the read command. So we're going to do select file read, and we're going to select the file we want to read. So we copy this, and come back over here to our web console. And we're going to paste this in. And we click run, and you can see that we get the root flag here. So that's the easy way to do it. Now, what if we want an actual shell out of this? So to get the actual shell, we can use the available exploits that are out there to get it. So now that we get the root password, how can we go back in a shell? First thing we would like to do here, right, is let's make sure that people can come back in remotely, that we don't have to shovel everything back through here. And since we already have access as SA, we can hit back here. And let's go to uh, Tools. I believe it's under Tools. Um, if it's not in Tools, Preferences and allow connections from other computers. So by allowing connections from other computers, now we're opening it up to the general internet. So we're gonna hit save here. And what we should be able to do, just to validate this, is we're gonna go to hawk.htb8082, and we should get the console, and we should be able to hit connect. Okay, so that works. So we're able to log back in. And this is important now too, because what we're gonna do now is we're gonna use the Python code to get a shell on the box. And basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this exploit that he has on his page and we're gonna use that to actually log in to get a shell on the box. So I have the exploit code downloaded and basically it's under Python h2.py saved as. So I'm gonna run Python h2.py. Okay, so <clears throat> now that we're able to remote login capabilities, we're gonna jump back over a box and we're gonna use the exploit code that we found uh, in this Gambler article down here, this Python script. I copied it over to my machine already. And what we're gonna do here is I saved it as cat h2. You can see that I have it saved here. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna run that command. And basically it's python h2.py dash capital H, um, the, IP, the name of the box, IP address of the box, the port, the database name, and the user account. And we're gonna leave off the P option because we're gonna go with no password. And when we do that, we get command line. So we can either use this method or the sh um, the simple method of just using the SQL, uh, the database query to gain the root flag. Now, the thing here is in HTTP, you don't need a root shell to get 
um, credit. You just need to get the root flag to get the credit. So in the OSCP, you probably would want to go the route of actually going the route again that shell and taking screenshots running system commands. There's many other options out there for different exploit code. Uh, if you go to exploit DB, there was a tons of articles out there about how to exploit H2 and uh, get shells on that. Uh, once again, if you like these videos, make sure you subscribe to my channel, uh, comment, uh, like the videos, click on the bell to get notified when I uh, post new material. Uh, give you guys a little heads up. I am currently working on my own vulnerable VM that I plan to release. I'm going to try to submit it to Hack the Box. Uh, if Hack the Box doesn't accept it for any reason, one reason or the other, uh, I'll probably just put it out on Vuln Hub just so people can try. Uh, I gotta say, creating a vulnerable VM is much harder than one would think. Uh, to overcome all the built-in security features to make things vulnerable and make sure it constantly works right, uh, it, it's been mind-blowing. Uh, I'm about five days into the build so far. Uh, every time I get something working, something else stops working. So I'll continue to give you guys updates as I release new videos. Uh, make sure you guys check out some of my Amazon links. Uh, thank you to those who have placed orders. Uh, it's an affiliate pro. I, I do make a commission off of them. Uh, for those who have ordered, thank you very much. The money goes to help keeping this channel running. Um, make sure you share the link with your friends. The more people subscribe, the more videos I'll get out the door. Um, once again, thanks for watching and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next video.